Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be covering the second part of light. And so we covered reflection of light and specifically the image being formed in a plain mirror and the differences between real images and virtual images in the previous video. But today we're going to be covering the rest of the topics, uh, which is to do with the refraction and uh, the converging lenses that we'll see. So refraction of light, remember refraction is basically the fact that light can travel at different speeds depending on the density of the index, but we're going to refine that definition to the fact that it's not so much the density but the refractive index of the material. Each material has a different refractive index and what it means is depending on what material it is, you know, how light travels, the speed of light that travels inside those particular mediums is going to be different. So every different medium is going to have a different refractive index. Now the higher the refractive index, the slower light travels versus a lower refractive index, the quicker light travels. So generally speaking, the denser the material, the higher the refractive index. Uh, so that's why initially in our definition we said, well, you know, depending on the density of the material, the light can travel at different speeds. But we're going to refine that again, as I said, and the more accurate term is the refractive index. Um, which really matters when it comes to how fast light travels inside a particular medium. There's three different formulas that uh, incorporates refractive index. The first definition or formula that we're going to use is refractive index, which is otherwise known as N for short, is equal to the speed of light in vacuum versus the speed of light in the medium. So N is a constant for any particular material and it doesn't have a unit as a result of the fact that it's just a constant. And so every material, every different material or every different medium has a different refractive index and that's as a result of the fact that light travels differently in all different mediums and the formula speed of uh, light and vacuum divided by the speed of light and medium can give you a refractive index and so another formula that you can use is n equals sine uh, sin 1 divided by uh, sine r so you've got um, i being the angle of uh, incidence and you've got r being the angle of refraction and uh, the angle of refraction, don't get it confused with the angle of reflection, which is what we looked at before, but there is an angle of refraction, which is to do with refraction, of course, and that also is very similar to the concept of angle of reflection, but we'll look at it in a bit more detail in the next slide. And the last one here incorporates uh, the critical angle, where 1 divided by sine critical angle is what uh, refractive index is, and we will take a look at what the critical angle is as well very shortly. So the refraction of light through a medium can sort of look pretty complex, but in fact it's not really if you think about it on a logical basis. Um, you want to consider light traveling from medium A to medium B. If you take a look at this particular example on the right, you can ignore everything for now. I just want you to note that there's an incident ray that is traveling initially from air and then it enters the glass block and then it goes back out into air. So it's going from first medium air into a second medium glass and then it's going back into the original medium air. That's what's happening here and you can see that the direction of light becomes altered as it enters this glass block. So when you have a light uh, that is traveling from any medium to another, let's just imagine A to B, you can have two possible scenarios. You can have either B having a lower refractive index than A or you could have um, you know, another situation where B has a higher refractive index than A. You know, so you know, basically, depending on the scenarios, the light will actually behave differently. So I want you to consider light going from air into glass, which is what we're looking at at the moment. And so the first thing you have to think about is, okay, well, which refractive index is higher? Is it air or is it glass? Um, and so in this case, glass certainly has a higher refractive index than air. And so what that means is that light will travel slower inside the glass block than it does in air. And so given that you're going from a low refractive index to a high refractive index, 
then what will happen is the light will bend towards the normal. So even in the situation of refraction, we're always going to have normal, which is the perpendicular line from the base of the surface at which the incident ray hits. And of course, just like before, the incident ray is the angle between the normal and the... Uh, so the angle of incident, sorry, is the angle between the incident ray and the normal. Now, if nothing happened and light was just traveling in the same medium, you can see that the light would just continue traveling in this direction here. But you can see that that's not the case. And again, it's because light travels slower in glass. And just remember, when it's going from a low to high refractive index, light's going to bend towards the normal. And in this case, given that this red line here is the normal, you can see that the light does bend towards the normal in this particular fashion. Uh, so let me just refresh that uh, so it's a little bit more cleaner. Um, but you know, hopefully you can understand here that this refracted ray is now traveling at a different uh, at a different direction, more closer to the normal. And so, if it was the opposite, right, going from a higher refractive index to a lower refractive index, you'll find that the light will go away from the normal. And you can see that here as light leaves the glass block. So glass is now the original, which is, you know, has a higher index, right? And air has a low index. So what that means now is when you're going from glass to air, you're going from high index to low index. And as a result of that, the light will travel away from the normal. And you can see, originally, the light rays would have traveled like this. But it's now bending away from the normal to travel in that direction there. So just to summarize, you've got the angle of incidence, you've got the angle of refraction, um, and the fact that the light will bend towards the normal if it's going from a low to high index, um, and oppositely if it's going from a high to low index, the light will change direction away from the normal, and that's really important uh, to, to understand. So given that you now know that the angle of refraction is going to change depending on you know what sort of index the light is going from, then you, we can start to consider this thing called the critical angle and even total internal reflection. So I want you to consider a light ray going from a medium of a higher to a lower index. So for example, you know, water to air or glass to air or whatever. And so as you can see, when the light ray hits the surface, um, you'll have some refraction, and the refraction, the pattern goes that uh, the light will bend away from the normal when it goes from a low to high index. So if you take a look at this first example here, you'll have the incident ray of incident angle I, but when it leaves the medium, because the, lens, the the light rays bend away from the normal, then the incident, uh, sorry, the refracted ray will be at a larger angle than the incident ray, because it bends away from the normal. And you can see that R looks bigger than I here. So, you know, we know that in this particular scenario, the refracted ray is bigger than the incident ray. Okay? Now, what tends to happen is the more you increase the angle of I, so originally in this first example here, it was the angle was sort of like this, right? Now, if you move that incident ray and put it at a larger angle, or if you increase the incident angle, then the pattern is that the refracted ray will bend more, and it will increase the refracted uh, angle or the angle of refraction, okay? For now, you can ignore these reflected rays. It just means that when an incident ray hits the surface, then some of that will be reflected downwards. Um, but uh, for the most part, we're talking about refraction here. Okay, so as you increase the incident angle, you will start to increase the angle of refraction as well. That's the key point I'm trying to make. But eventually, when you start to increase the incident angle large enough, so here in this bottom bit here, you can see that our first example was something like this. That's the first 
angle, which we then extended to something like this, and that you know that produced the larger refracted angle. But it comes to a point where when you increase the incident angle large enough, it causes a refracted ray to go directly parallel to the surface at a 90 degree angle from the norm. That incident angle at, at which it results in the refracted ray traveling at that 90 degree you know, angle away from the norm or the normal, that is what we call the critical angle. And if we go any angle of incidence beyond the critical angle, so when I becomes greater than the critical angle, that's when you get total internal reflection, which is when the entire ray just becomes reflected right back into the same medium. And so, you know, I hope that makes sense. Um, if not, I'll just show you a really quick demonstration of how, what I mean. So, oops. So basically, if you have this medium here, and you've got the norm here, right? I'll use different uh, marker pens. So here you've got this light ray of angle of incidence that's uh, going to you know travel away from the norm as it goes out of the block right and so something like that so you can clearly see that the angle of refraction here is larger than the angle of incidence um, but what we're gonna do now is see what happens when we increase the angle of incidence to something like this Okay, now the angle of incidence is a little bit bigger, and what we find is it increases the angle of refraction. But eventually, when we do that too much, we find that there comes a point where you have the angle of incidence, again, it's this, this time, that results in an angle of refraction of 90 degrees, like that, traveling exactly on the surface of the surface of whatever medium this is. And so naturally, you might expect, if we were to increase that even further, so now the angle of incidence is higher than the critical angle because that one there, that's the critical angle. The angle of incidence at which it leads to this phenomenon where it's directly 90 degrees. But if you go beyond that, as I said here, now that leads to total internal reflection where you don't get any refraction, you don't get any of these light rays going out into the second medium anymore, it's just straight bounced back into the original medium. So I hope that makes sense. So that's total internal refraction and how reflection, sorry, and that's how it relates to the critical angle. So the total internal reflection is useful because it can be used in optical fibers, uh, where optical fibers has a thin glass core with an outer cladding which has a lower refractive index because remember total internal reflection and this whole thing about critical angle this only works when you're going from high to low medium and so the total internal reflex re reflection occurs at all rays that are hit within the boundary between the core and the cladding at an angle that's larger than the critical angle and that just sort of helps with the transmission of the um the the energy within the fibers so I want to have a quick talk about converging lenses. So the concept is that uh, these lenses here, they can converge light rays. When you have light rays entering from one side, uh, then it sort of focuses those right light rays by converging those light rays on the other side. And so all convex lenses, which they'll have different powers, and depending on the power, it can converge more or less. But ultimately, all converging lenses has a point where it focuses all the light rays coming from the other side, and all the the point at which all the light rays are focused is called the principal focus, or you could say the focal point as well. Focal point or principal focus. Focus. Sorry, the. Principal axis is basically the imaginary horizontal line that goes at right angles or 90 degrees to the lens position. Uh, the distance between the center of the lens and the principal focus or the focal point is called the focal length. Okay, 
So these are landmarks that are very important. Now, when light comes from an object at a far distance, uh, that's those light rays are considered to be parallel, which is you know what you see here. Each light ray is sort of you know coming exactly parallel to another. That's what we assume for any object or any light that's coming from uh, a far distance away. So we need to take a look at these things called ray diagrams because what we want to do is we want to be able to put an object uh, along you know, one side of the convex lens and we want to see what sort of images that it produces depending on the position of the object. Um, so we're going to consider this space here on the left hand side where the object goes and this side here is where you have the image being formed. Although, not necessarily will you have the images being formed on this ha right hand side, but you know, for the sake of just you know, explaining things, we're going to place the object on the left and we're going to draw out the rays and we're going to see where the images uh, become formed. And so here are a few landmarks that's really, really important. You have the center of the lens, you have the principal axis, which is that line going through the middle. Now, this is the principal focus. Again, that's the light, uh, that's the point at which all the light would be focused if you had parallel rays going from this left-hand side here, which is basically what we saw here, right? You've got the parallel rays coming from the left, and you have the principal focus point on the right. Now, you could equally have light rays coming from the left-hand side like this, parallel rays, and you'd get that it would simply just focus everything at the same focal length away from the lens as it would do on the other hand side. So this is just a mirror image of each other here. So let me just uh, refresh that. So important landmark so far is that uh, you've got the principal focus which you can find on each side of the lens and you've also got the focal length, right? And so the focal length between the first principal axis and the second principal axis, well actually 2f is not really anything, it's just um, the distance between the first principal axis and um, a focal length apart from that, okay? So this in itself doesn't really mean anything so far at the very least, uh, but ultimately you know, why we do this is because you can either have the object placed in three possible different positions, right? So if you take a look at um, this right here, then you can either place the object here, and if you place the object there, you're placing it between the lens center and the first focal point, right? Um, you could also have an object here in between the first focal point and you know a focal length away from it uh, but you can also put it quite far away outside of the range of the first two focal lengths okay because this is one focal length away this is two focal lengths away okay so one f and two f and this is two f and beyond there are three different positions that you could potentially put an object and depending on where the object goes, it's going to result in a different type of image and that's why we're going through this. So first of all, let's imagine that you put an object beyond the second focal point or beyond the second focal length. And so if you put an object away you know, beyond that, then you're going to have to do some ray tracing to figure out where the image is going to go. The rules go like this. The first line that you're going to draw is um, going to point, uh, going to be parallel to this axis here. Uh, okay, so you're just going to draw a line that sort of goes like that. Now, how do you know where the light will bend after it passes through the lens? Well, that's relatively easy. Remember, any parallel lay, ray that you find on one side is going to be focused at the principal focus or the focal point. And so you just draw a line that cuts through like that. Okay. Uh, the second line that you want to draw is straight through the middle of the lens from the top of the object. So you've got the top of the object here, which is where all the light is diverging from, and you want to just 
draw a line just going straight cut through the middle this you know this yellow line here and the third line if possible would be to draw a line cutting through the focal point on the same side of the lens and then sort of traveling on a parallel basis after it's passed through the lens so this blue line here is you drawing a line straight and then once it passes through the lens it focuses through the principal uh, focus right well this green line is sort of the opposite of that as you may imagine uh, light coming parallel from this left uh, this right hand side and imagine if it sort of crossed the lens and started being focused on the left hand side then you know that it will cut through the focus point there so blue yellow green now this might not always be possible to do this last step this green one and you'll see why later but um, for now draw the blue one which is the parallel line and then it cuts through the principal focus on the other end draw the yellow line and that one is the one that cuts through the middle of the lens now the point at which you have all lines crossing that becomes the tip of the image because you started off with the tip of the image and all light started there so that's where the tip of the image is and you can see if you draw it what can you see well first of all the image is real because real light rays passing through the lens is causing a convergence that's leading to the formation of an image so that's a real image you can see that the image is inverted it's upside down and you can see that compared to the original object, the image is actually smaller than the object. So it actually gets a bit diminished as well. The second possibility is the object going between the two um, focal lengths, first F and the second F. And when that happens, we can do the same. First draw that horizontal line, and once it passes through the lens, it cuts through the principal focus and that's that blue line there. The orange, uh, sorry, the yellow line is again the one that just goes straight through the middle of the lens and, you know, converges with the blue, uh, blue, blue ray there. And then the last one again is the green line that starts from the top of the object but cuts through the focal points or the principal focus on that same side and once it passes through the lens again just a parallel line and you can see that all three rays converge at this point again you'll find that the image is real and it's also inverted but in this case the image is actually magnified it's actually bigger than the object itself so that's an important distinction now lastly you have an, ob uh, an object that is placed between the lens itself and its first focal length and so when that happens again you draw the horizontal line that becomes that crosses the focal point on the other side and you again draw the yellow line that passes through the center of the lens now in this case you can't carry out that third step because the focal point is behind the object now so you can't do that thing where you cross the focal point uh, and then you know extrapolate it on the other end you can't do that anymore so when the object is between the lens and the first focal point then you only need two rays which is the first two steps and now just like we did with the plane mirror you can see that at no point do these two lines one and two at no point do they actually cross and so what you can do though is extrapolate where they appear to be crossing behind the lens and that point at which those imaginary lines cross that's the tip of the image and you can see that the image is this time virtual because again you're using imaginary lines to sort of see where it might correspond it's an imaginary thing it's virtual and the image is upright and it's also magnified and the image is uh, sort of presented to you on the same side as the object itself which was different from the previous two examples the last thing I want to talk about is white light and dispersion uh, white light is not in itself composed of a single wavelength uh, you know basically it's a combination of all the different wavelengths that you can see within the visible spectrum each wavelength has a certain color for example green we only see it as green is because our brains associate green with the wavelength of 500 nanometers uh, red 
The only reason it's different from green is because the wavelength of the color red is actually 700 nanometers. So our brains perceive these wavelengths differently, giving rise to different colors that we see. And light that has a single frequency, for example, just plain green light that's, you know, of 500 nanometers, that's called monochromatic light, which is very different from white light, which is actually when, what happens when you combine every single monochromatic light and when you combine it together then you get white light which isn't uh, you know strictly a wavelength on its own it's a combination of all the things that we can see so you can actually sort of uh, disperse out and separate the different wavelengths by using a prism you have white light coming through here but you can see as it enters the prism and out it converts into its original components and all these different colors represent a different wavelength so i hope that video made sense guys feel free to check out freeexamacademy.com that's where i put all the notes for all these powerpoint slides that i'm making and also patreon.com where i focus and drill down on past paper questions and just getting you up to date with how to answer various questions. I've got a lot of content for biology and chemistry so far. Physics will be coming in the next few months, uh, but I just want to get through the course itself first here on YouTube. So just uh, look out for that and uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.